ادع الى سبيل ربك بالحكمه والموعظه الحسنه وجادله بالتي هي احسن ان ربك هو اعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته brothers and sisters in islam friends colleagues students followers this is part three of my rebuttal of Dennis Jaron and his article in which he claimed that the Quran and Sunnah contain scientific absurdities and which we have in part one and part two eliminated and destroyed and falsified all of his false claims and all of his illogical and irrational allegations so in this part, part three, we're going to continue on with some of his claims and continue rebutting them and refuting all of the falsehood that he has mentioned throughout his article. So Dennis Jaron, he says in Sahih Bukhari, he says there is a hadith in Sahih Bukhari number 490 that states that if a woman or a dog passes in front of you while you are praying, your prayer will not make it to heaven. While there are chauvinistic implications here, I'd like to focus on the scientific aspect. What is it about women and dogs that nullify prayers? Are the prayers carried by a type of sonic wave that women and dogs disrupt? It is obvious that there is no scientific explanation to this absurd myth. Also, he talks about that do- a hadith number 540 that, all do- that dogs are evil and should be killed. And so let me say this, Dennis, first of all, what's your proof for your statement that if someone walks in front of a praying person, that his prayer is not lifted to the sky or paradise? There exists no proof for what you mentioned at all in this hadith. So what you have said here is, first of all, incorrect once again. And what is meant here, if you look at the Arabic wording that came in the hadith, is al-qata, al-qata which can literally mean to disrupt or cut off. But what many of the scholars have mentioned, it means to disrupt the concentration and focus, meaning that the remembrance of Allah is cut off and decreased, solely because one is preoccupied with looking left and right during the prayer. He's being distracted in the prayer. Not because it nullifies the prayer. Women walking in front of men draw men's glances and attention, as all men are attracted to women. Those who are upon the natural disposition that Allah created them upon. Dogs and donkeys distract people because of their sounds and movements. And many people are scared of dogs and worried about them jumping or barking at the person. Also, as I said, the mean qata. The word, the word qata in the hadith could mean a decrease, a decrease in the reward that the person will receive in the prayer solely because he doesn't have complete focus and complete concentration. And it does certainly not mean that the prayer is invalid or is not accepted. So it doesn't mean that the prayer is cut off or that the prayer is invalid or not accepted. And I say you are mistaken once again, Dennis, and I will enlighten you with a few important principles to be able to understand the issue properly. First of all, there doesn't exist anything except that it has some type of similarity with other things. There doesn't exist anything within the creation except that that thing resembles something else in the creation with in certain characteristics and traits, even if they are literal or abstract meanings. For example, the human being has a similarity with inanimate objects. The human being is an animate object, but he has similarities and traits which are similar to inanimate objects. For example, the fact that both of them are created and existent. Just how a rock is created and existent, similarly a human being is created and existent. And the human resembles the animal in so many traits and characteristics. Both of them are creatures, 
Both of them are filled with life. Both of them eat. Both of them drink. Both of them sleep. And both of them die. And actually the philosophers, they call the human being, what do they call him? Haywanun natiq. They call him a speaking animal. Similarly, between humans and plants are similarities as well. They both are living creatures. They both give forth offspring. And they both need nutrients to survive. And it has never been known amongst those with sound intellects and those who think rationally and logically that anyone ever considered all the aspects of similarity that we previously mentioned to be considered something deficient in the human being. That necessitates one to dispraise, slander, or talk bad about the human being. They are just aspects of similarities and resemblances, either praiseworthy or they are congenital and are not related to praise or dispraise at all. Second principle, Dennis, tashbih, tashbih, tashbih in the Arabic language and in the knowledge of mantiq or logic. And tashbih is when you resemble something to another thing. Tashbih in Arabic and in Mantip is comprised of four pillars, four main pillars, okay? Four main pillars, in which if you want to resemble one thing to the next thing, then these four pillars must be present in, between the two things that you're resembling. The first is the object that is being resembled. The object that is being resembled. Let's say, for example, this phone, okay? The object that is being resembled. And now we want to resemble it to this book here. Okay, so the first thing is the object that is being resembled. Secondly, the thing that is being resembled to the aspect of resemblance between the two. Now we want to talk about how this phone resembles this book. And in Arabic, the Arabic word or letter that is used to resemble the two things, the aspects or traits. So if we wanted, for example, to search for a ruling, we wanted to search for a ruling or extract a ruling about a particular resemblance. Should this be considered praiseworthy or dispraiseworthy? And it is deficient and mistaken to observe the mushabbahabihi, that thing or aspect in which the other object is being resembled to, while not considering the specific aspect of resemblance and similarity at the same time. So there is a hadith, Dennis, where some of the companions mentioned the resemblance of his actions to that of an animal. The resemblance of his actions to that of an animal. For example, as Ammar ibn Yasser, he said, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam sent for me to do something for him. And I became sexually impure, and I didn't find any water to bathe. So I rolled around in the dirt like an animal does. So no one has ever understood that this companion, this great companion, may Allah give him the highest place in the paradise, was resembling himself to the animal in every aspect. Rather, he was resembling his actions to the actions of an animal. So the resemblance was restricted here and not absolute. So it is essential, Dennis, and very important that one understands the Arabic language, which is the language of the Qur'an and the language of the Sunnah, before one indulges himself into these false doubts and misconceptions, which only prove one thing, Dennis, which only prove the ignorance and misunderstanding of those engaging themselves in these false claims and false attempts to try to claim that the Qur'an and Sunnah contain scientific absurdities. And not only that, but their ignorance of the Arabic language and the usage of the Arabic language. So if one wants to discuss issues such as this, then it is vital and important that one examines the aspect of resemblance between the two things before claiming that the resemblance is an absolute and complete dispraise or disrespect of women or slander of the female gender. And even in the English language, Dennis, if someone does something bad or despicable or praiseworthy or dispraiseworthy, for example, people sometimes, if somebody does something dispraiseworthy or despicable or disgusting or something bad, people sometimes call that person what? 
they say, you're a pig or you're a dog because of his despicable actions in the, and the similarities of his actions with those of a dog and those of a pig. And one is not intending by calling someone by that name that he is really a pig or a dog. Thirdly, Dennis, you need to understand that whoever observes and ponders and contemplates over the hadith here and thinks about the question of the questioner, meaning yourself, that a woman, a donkey, or a dog cut off or decreased the reward or decreased the focus and concentration of the prayer and placing something similar to a saddle will protect you from that as it came in the hadith. In this hadith we find that the aspect of resemblance that is intended is something that has no relation to any negative traits or characteristics of the donkey or the dog or that the woman is the same status of these animals. And we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from statements such as these. And Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, didn't intend that when she said, you've resembled us to dogs and monkeys, she didn't intend when she said that, right? Rather, she intended the particular action of walking in front of someone while they are praying. And the aspect of resemblance here is disturbing someone praying by walking in front of them, which decreases the focus and concentration of the praying person. Another thing that we should bring to attention, Dennis, is that walking in front of someone who is praying, no matter who or what it may be, whether it's a male, a female, human or animal, is all impermissible. And if passing in front of someone who is praying is impermissible from the beginning, no matter if it is a male or female, and if that affects the person's prayer, then some of the scholars have taken the opinion that cut off, that it means the prayer is cut off, or uh, in the hadith doesn't mean that it invalidates the prayer, and that it necessitates one makes it up, rather it means that it is cut off and deficient from completion and perfection and the highest amount of reward, and that the focus and concentration is decreased because of the excessive movement and the excessive looking back and forth. And this is because solely that a woman is attractive to men. And donkeys make noises and cause disturbances, as we mentioned earlier. And dogs frighten and scare people, which all disrupt the person praying. Actually, Dennis, it is completely unfair and unjust for a researcher or criticizer, no matter what his religion or ideology or madhab or background may be, to take only one text that is analogous, that can be interpreted in many different ways, and has no relationship with his article or claim and make this text as something to slander, disrespect, and defame an entire religion. A religion that has the best of laws, the best of moral principles and, principles and standards, the best of ethics and teachings, while intentionally ignoring numerous other texts and fundamentals and teachings that speak about the high the honored, the dignified and noble status of women in Islam, in which we find no other religion, no other constitution, no other laws mentioning similar texts about the noble status of women like we find in the Islamic resources. So then, Dennis, he goes on to say, he says, No one should be surprised by this, as numerous hadiths say dogs are evil and should be killed. Of course, when it comes to killing animals, there are different laws for different species. Dogs are to be killed instantly. However, snakes are to first get verbal warning if he comes to your house. If the snake comes a second time, kill him. The interesting thing about such a hadith is the fact that snakes cannot hear. It is bad enough to assume that any animal would understand you giving a verbal warning. But to assume that an animal that is deaf will understand you is ridiculous. It is the equivalent of writing a, a note for a bat and leaving it on the door so that you may read it later. We've already responded to this doubt. Also, one should not be surprised or amazed about this because all rational thinkers know that some dogs and animals can be harmful by others. Can be, uh, dogs and animals can be harmful and harm others. And they sometimes need to be killed. 
as was mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, that the Messenger of Allah ordered to kill all qilab. So, <clears throat> I say, first of all, Dennis, first of all, this hadith has been considered to be weak by many of the scholars of Islam, such as Shaykh Muhammad Nasruddin al-Abani and others as well have mentioned that it is weak and not accepted. But, if we were to say the hadith is authentic, for your sake, for the sake of argument, then the way a Muslim deals with al-kilab, or can be literally translated as dogs, but it can also mean other animals from amongst the creation, is only a part of the system and teachings that a Muslim has learned about how to deal with all of the creation within the realm and under the umbrella of preserving the things that our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, told us to protect and preserve. So therefore, we can understand from what we've been taught in the sunnah about how to interact with kilab in light of the following principles. First of all, number one, that is you need to understand that a Muslim never despises or doesn't dislike any creature from Allah's creation. And actually, our religion teaches us to be merciful and act peaceful with all creatures. And we have texts that have come that order us to kill kilab or dogs and also other texts that order us to act goods towards them as well. As the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he said, While a man was walking on his way, he became extremely thirsty. He found a well. He went down into it to drink water. Upon leaving it, he saw a dog which was panting out of thirst. His dog was lolling out and he was eating moist earth from extreme thirst. So the man thought to himself, This dog is extremely thirsty as I was. So the man descended into the well, filled up his leather sock with water, and holding it in his teeth, climbed up and quenched the thirst of the dog. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciated his action and forgave him for his sins. Also, many of the companions and the disciples of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they said, shall we be rewarded for showing kindness to animals also? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he said, he says, a reward is given in connection with every living creature. So did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa order to kill the dogs or the creatures in these hadith, Mr. Dennis? Why not? So I advise you, Dennis, to not speak about anything until you understand the issue completely and gather up all the information related to the topic of discussion. If you don't do this, then your conclusions and views will always be deficient, just as all of your claims here in this article. And also the hadith that mentioned the killing of kilab are authentic. And the Prophet ordered with killing all of them. But then this order to kill them was abrogated and only specific for killing black dogs or black creatures or ones with two spots and wild and ferocious ones as it is permissible to kill them because why? Because they are harmful. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa never ordered to completely eliminate the whole species solely because Allah created them for some kind of wisdom. Rather, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ ordered with killing all of them in al Medina because it was the place of divine revelation. And the angels do not enter a place that contains dogs or kilat. And the dogs and other animals in the time of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, they used to run in and out of the vicinity of the masjid of the Prophet Muhammad in Medina in the beginning. Then the order to clean the masajid and to keep them clean from impurities and purify them was revealed. So then Allah revealed the way to purify oneself and one's place of worship from impurities. And also our Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarified the impurities and filthiness of the dog and its saliva and that it carries a lot of bacteria, a lot of worms and unclean things that can cause many sicknesses that harm human beings, sometimes leading to various very dangerous and contagious sicknesses. 
So, Dennis, the Muslim is constantly conscientious about things that could bring about harm and the need of removing anything that can bring about harm and that the greater harm should always be eliminated by removing the lesser harm as well or anything that may lead to a greater harm. And the harm that occurs with the presence of dogs is what necessitates the removal of them by killing them sometimes. So how do you know that snakes, you mentioned, you said that snakes are deaf. How do you know that snakes don't hear sounds? Do you have some research? Do you have some proofs that claim that snakes don't hear? The scientific research you might have could be very outdated or old. And I say that you're mistaken once again, Dennis as scientific studies disagree with your claim and actually prove that snakes do hear sounds. Neurobiologist Bruce Young of the University of Massachusetts, he says, there's been this enduring myth that snakes are deaf and that behavioral studies have suggested that snakes can in fact hear. And now this work has gone one step further and explained how. So Dennis, you mentioned that in the beginning of your article that the Qur'an contains myths and things like this, but it sounds like actually you are the one who are trying to propagate myths by mentioning many of your false claims here. So yes, Dennis, yes, snakes do not have a visible ear, so they may not hear sounds exactly as we do, but it is not correct to say that snakes are deaf. They have vestiges of the apparatus for hearing inside their heads. And that setup is attached to their jaw bones. So they feel vibrations very well and also may hear low frequency airborne sounds. As scientists have proved. So what is your response, Dennis? We have scientific studies that prove this to be true, that snakes do hear contrary to what you claim that snakes are deaf and contrary to the myth that also the scientists have mentioned that snakes are deaf and we also have the sunnah of the prophet muhammad that told us about this over 1438 years ago so what are you going to do dennis are you going to admit that this hadith is one of the miracles of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the desert bedouin who you claim didn't know anything are you going to admit it that this hadith is one of the miracles of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and that the Arabic prophet from the desert preceded all of your counterparts from amongst the scientists and scholars and all the people in the world to know about this information and be informed and know that our Prophet Muhammad didn't come to knowledge about this except from Allah the creator of the world the knower of the seen and the knower of the unseen as well? Or are you going to deny this and denounce this miracle based upon your lack of understanding and arrogance, Dennis? Furthermore, I ask you, Dennis, if you had a dog, and we talked about this earlier, if you had a dog and you threw a stick for it to go fetch it and told it, go, f go and fetch the stick, and then the dog quickly ran and brought the stick back to you and put it in your hand. My question is, Dennis, did the dog understand what you said to it or no? Or was this a coincidence? And if you told the dog, don't jump on people or sit down, and the dog sat, did the dog understand what you said? Or is this also a coincidence? So this is proof that it isn't impossible for animals to understand human language. And we refuted this earlier. And you yourself admit this as you mentioned previously, that human beings can communicate with chimpanzees and monkeys. How often do you contradict and conflict yourself, Mr. Dennis? Then, Dennis, he goes on to say, The following hadith shows poor sanitation habits of Muhammad and his followers. And he mentions the hadith of Bi'r Bada'a, right? The well of Bada'a, which was in Medina. So, I say, Dennis, this is another mistaken and false claim. First of all, because you have no knowledge of Bi'r Bada'a, the well or the area of water or the river 
that was similar to a well in Saudi Arabia, in the city of La Medina, you have no knowledge of this place. And secondly, you have limited knowledge of the history behind Bada. And let me inform you about this. The people back in that time who were living in Medina, they would dispose of their rubbish by throwing it behind their houses, as is common in many of the countries today. And sometimes when they would throw the garbage from their window, from their house or from the back door of their house, what would happen when the rain would come? Sometimes the rain water would come along and take along with it the refuse and garbage and rubbish that they used to dispose of behind their houses. And what would happen? It would flow to this area of water which they called right the well of Bada. Solely because the trash and garbage was in the path, was in the path flow, the normal flow of the water after rain. And by no means should this be understood that people used to throw their garbage and impurities inside the source of water or inside the well. This is something that not even a non-Muslim, you yourself, would accept or approve of. So, who could, so how could one think that the companions, the best Muslims who were living on the face of the earth, would do and approve such a thing? The well of Bada'ah was a well that contained a large amount of water. And it was so much that it would change when these things would be thrown into it by the rainwater, uh, so much that it would not change when these things would be thrown into it by the rainwater or floods. And therefore it would still remain pure. And we need to recall what was said about this well as well, Dennis, that the well had a large amount of water, meaning that it was constantly filling up with new water. كان الماء متجدد, right? The water will always renew itself just like a river or a stream. And the well, it was close to two big gardens in Medina as well. And it was used to irrigate them, kind of like a river. And if it was described as resembling a river, then we are certain that its water was pure. And for this reason, the moving water that garbage or filth may be thrown into is still okay to make ablution from. So it is far-fetched that any Muslim, not to say the companions and disciples of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, would do such a thing. As the Prophet Muhammad wasallam cursed anybody who defecates in or close to water sources. So how could someone even think that they would use a water source for the whole city to throw impurities into? And I'll add on to that, Dennis. Our Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he is the one who taught people personal cleanliness. He is the one who ordered and commanded the Muslims to wash their hands before eating and to clean themselves with water after urinating and defecating, something that many of you and your counterparts don't know how to do until this day. Prophet Muhammad is the one who prohibited his followers from urinating in still water and ordered the Muslims to clean their houses and residences and prohibited us from touching our private areas and to take a shower after we have intimacy with our wives and not to breathe in cups or over food. He is the one who ordered us to use the miswak to clean our mouth and teeth and to bathe and take a shower and to take a shower on Fridays and to clean out our hair, to clean and to shave our armpits and to shave our private areas and to trim our fingernails and many other etiquettes of cleanliness and purity. He taught the Muslims these things during times that people knew nothing about how to cleanse themselves, how to cleanse their teeth or mouths, or just general practices of cleanliness. The Prophet also taught us about the harms of eating swine, eating pork, and prohibited his followers from doing so because of the harms and diseases it causes and prohibited the consummation of intoxicants because of the harm that they cause to the liver, the harm that they cause to the kidney, the brain, the stomach, and the body in general. He also ordered us to clean and purify the bowl or container that a dog licks in seven times, once with dirt, because of the bacteria that is contained in the dog's saliva. 
he told us all about these things over 1438 years ago and the harms that these animals can cause while other people love and care for their dogs more than their own relatives and some even call their dogs their children. So why was Europe affected by the plague and sickness in ancient times? It was because of their lack of cleanliness and the lack of knowing the proper techniques to cleanse themselves and to take care of personal hygiene. As for the well of Bida'a that you mentioned, then it is known that people didn't used to drink from it. They used to make ablution from it. Another thing to keep in mind is that the well was constantly filled with new water, as we mentioned. And it is known by anyone with knowledge of rivers, lakes, streams, etc., is that still water, water that doesn't move, contains a large amount of bacteria. And if we use your logic, then no one would drink from lakes, streams, rivers, and ponds, and reservoirs, solely because they all contain bacteria. And the reality is that all water that people use and drink contains bacteria. There doesn't exist any type of water except that it contains some type of bacteria in it, as scientific studies have proved, but only if you will accept that, Dennis. So then, Dennis, he goes on concluding, he's saying, Muslims cite alleged scientific miracles in the Quran and Hadith to try and prove divine origin of their faith. In short, in this short study of Islamic science, these claims have been debunked right, until the end of his conclusion. So I say, Dennis, unfortunately, Dennis, all throughout your article, you failed to bring one proof to establish your claims that the Quran and Sunnah contain scientific absurdities or false miracles. Rather, all that you mentioned here in this article were just personal views, doubts, and misconceptions based upon your faulty and deficient understanding of the texts in the Quran and Sunnah, and secondly, your misunderstanding and lack of knowledge of the Arabic language. So maybe we should change the title of your article to The Intellectual, Logical, and Rational Absurdities in Mr. Dennis Jaron's Understanding of the Qur'an and Sunnah. I think this is a more proper title for your article. And this will actually be the title of my rebuttal of you. And all intellectuals, Dennis, Muslim as well as non-Muslim, know that the Qur'an and Sunnah contain scientific miracles that have been discovered by scientists and researchers in the past, and they will also discover them in the future. And this is only proof of the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and that the Qur'an and Sunnah came from the Creator of the universe, the one who knows everything before human beings even thought about them. And he and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed some of the secrets of the universe in his revelation and concealed other secrets amongst himself to test us, to test human beings, to test mankind. That will human beings, will we as deficient, fallible human beings with weak, weak intellects, will we be sufficed with the signs that Allah did provide for us in the creation? and we witness on a daily basis as proof for Allah's existence, and that He is the one worthy of worship alone? Or will we deny these signs and be arrogant of these signs, just like the atheists and many similar to you do? Muslims affirm and confirm and are certain that the Qur'an and Sunnah are pure revelation from Allah and the greatest miracle of the Prophet Muhammad. And if all the humans and jinn and all of your friends and researchers gathered together to produce something similar to the Qur'an or the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, they would never be able to do so. So with this, I'll conclude my rebuttal of Dennis Jaron and his article which claimed that there are scientific absurdities in the Qur'an and Sunnah. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue us upon goodness and grant all of you guidance from him 
and increase us in beneficial knowledge and increase us in our efforts to defend the Sunnah and defend the Quran and defend Islam and defend the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this merciful and beautiful religion of Islam in which we need to bring to all of humanity to refute and rebut many of the false doubts and misconceptions that are in the propaganda which is falsely being directed toward the Muslims and the people of truth. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with all of you and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of you guidance. Subhanaka lahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.